Well, first of all, uh, both of my parents are not from New York, so they were as interested and, and, and marveled at the city as much as uh, I was. And so when there was a matter of going to a museum, my mother immediately wanted to take me to the museum because she was learning as well. Uh, the, the circus, the rodeo, all of those things were a part of our uh, annual out outings. The opera was not. So that when I started hearing opera and fell totally in love with it, they came along because for them it was also new and they, they always encouraged me to open my mind to the, the importance of an education, extremely important for them, for me and, and my brother. Uh, they, they were the type of parents that felt that uh, it's never too good for your, what you didn't have is never, less you, your child, sorry, that your child should always have more than you had. And because of that, they insisted on a college education, even though uh, when I told them that I wanted to sing in the opera, finally, my father thought it was something like being a can-can girl, so he was totally <laughs> un unhappy until he finally saw an opera on television. But he was a little bit dismayed because he said, you want to go around, where's the fish? It was bohem. Get the bread. <laughs> you know, he heard it in English and wasn't terribly, terribly impressed. He couldn't understand why the fat girl always got the tenor. But he did begin to like it, and, and my mother to fell totally in love with it and traveled with me until her death. Well, it wasn't that way at first. I sang in the church as a young child and grew up singing in the church, so I knew that I enjoyed singing very much. Um, I didn't include opera as something I wanted to sing, but it, performing was, it was just a good feeling for me, and I still love to perform. Um, but after hearing the opera and, and having this intense feeling about it, then I knew that, that that's where the direction I wanted to take. Before that, it was always to be a school teacher. Remember, I grew up in, at a time back in the mm -hmm, in 50s uh, when doctor, lawyer, and Indian chief were your possibilities. You didn't think of becoming an astronaut you know, or, or, or to discover the salt vaccine. You know, you, you, your, your opportunities were limited, so you thought. Um, and so I wanted to be a, a school teacher. I wanted to teach high school and perhaps college. But after going into the profession and having a success in the profession, I realized that there were some of the things that I thought were important that still needed to be taught, a part of the training of a, a, a young opera singer. And that's how the idea for the, for the prelude came about, for the role class, because there were things that not that I had a lot of, it's what I didn't have, things that I thought were missing in my training that I got as time went on because experience gets it for you eventually, but sometimes that takes a long time. And I think we need it nowadays before uh, you've had some years of experience. I like the, the idea of being another person very, very much. And I like the idea of being a lot of different people to see if I could be those different people. But I only wanted to be the people that I liked. So I love Amelia in Baloi Mascara and enjoy putting on her skin, as I, I always call it. I love Butterfly. She's dramatic. She's, she's wonderful. She's warm. She's, she gives. Um, the roles, the characters that I don't like, I don't go near. Because if I don't like her, if I don't really love her, I can't sing her, sing her, live her life. That was a Professor Joseph Tournau at the Opera Workshop at Hunter College. The Opera Workshop at Hunter used to meet in the high school auditorium. And you know, when you're about 13 and 14, you're very bold. And when you're in a group, you're even worse. And we would stand outside and listen to the opera singers. And we'd imitate them and make funny gestures. They didn't see us, of course, but we got caught. Taken into Professor Tournau, and <laughs> as a punishment, he said, OK, you sing for me. And instead of throwing me out on my ears, I well deserved, he said, are you interested in being a singer? And I told him, of course not. You know, I want to be a school teacher with pride. And uh, he ought to sort of egg me on to come back and sing again. And uh, he sent me to Mrs. Gurevich, who was my only teacher in all these years. Uh, and little by little, I realized that that's where I lived. That's what I wanted to do. That's who I wanted to be.
She was also the type of mentor that I think, unfortunately, we don't have many of these types nowadays, perhaps more than, than I think, but you know, there's so many, there's so much talent out there too, it's hard to know. But she, she took me to my first dentist because she didn't like the school dentist and she was afraid that they weren't doing a good job. She asked my mother, could I go to her private dentist? And I'm only saying that to say that she t became involved with my life. She didn't take my mother's place because no one could, but she was second mother. Well, it certainly gave uh, me the opportunity to sing for people at the Met who were, you know, the people who could make you or break you, but uh, some, it didn't mean that you would never have a career if they had said no. I, at least I wouldn't have taken it that way, but I, they did say yes, and I went into the finals, along with Grace Bunbury and Alona uh, Combrink and Charles K.L. Davis. Um, and Mr. Bing actually gave me small parts in the beginning. I sang the voice from heaven. Of course, the famous story is my mother didn't hear it because she went to the bathroom at the end of Act Two. They don't think about me at all. They, you know, it's always my mother. <laughs> but um, uh, then he, I was one of the Valkyrs, one of the Norns in the, the um, production of The Ring with Erich Kleinsdorf, because uh, Maestro Leinsdorf didn't want, uh, he wanted a particular level, uh, level, but let me be careful how I say this. He wanted, uh, he didn't want the most lyric sounds. He wanted to start already with a fuller sound so that he could take, it, take us up to the sound of, um, of the of dramatic soprano to be, to, to compete with the orchestra. At least that's the way it was put to us. And so I sang the bird as well as one of the Norns and one of the Valkyrs and one of the Rhine maidens. And uh, then Mr. Bing said, look, you, you need the experience to go, go to Europe and if the opportunity comes, I'll call you. And I never thought that he really meant that. I thought he was saying, oh, go on your way. I've given you a little push now. Do what you have to do. Um, but sure enough, in 1965, 65, when Birgit Nielsen became ill, he called and said, would you like to try the Aida? In the meantime, I had sung it in Vienna with um, Maestro von Karajan and, in, uh, and Maestro Klobuchar, Maestro von Matacic. Uh, you know, so I got and Alberto Herrera and Dusseldorf, so I had quite a bit of experience with great conductors and didn't find, a, I did, felt, and felt that I could come back to the Met with that part. She was very, very happy for me, but the first chance she got to go with me, she came along and enjoyed herself. I can't tell you, she never stopped learning, first of all. But she was also so open, and people liked her so much because um, she. They, everyone called her Mama at the Met, you know. But really, uh, whenever we, whenever she would go with me, she wasn't a stage mother. She was uh, my friend, and uh, and more happy for. Pl she would say, uh, "I say, are you coming to the theater tonight?" She say, "Who's singing?" She, I say, "Placido and Cher." Oh yes, then I'll come. <laughs> you know, didn't I say what about me? <laughs> but. Um, she was just a real, a real encouragement, a real backbone, and um, with a big smile and, and happy for me. I don't think she knew when I sing, didn't sing well. I went first to sing at the America Häuser in uh, Austria and Germany. Lots of recitals and lots of excellent reviews. As a matter of fact, in Vienna, when I went back to sing in the, at the Staatsoper in Aida, one of the critics wrote before the performance, she's an accomplished leader singer, why does she want to sing opera? Because there, if you were an were accomplished leader sing, singer, why would you sing opera, sort of was the attitude. But um, listen, opera is where I wanted to go. But the training, the, the, the recitals, the, the oratorios, uh, played a great and a very important part in my life because it got me out there. It also in, in styles that didn't hurt the voice in any way. Um, and learning how to sing before the public, uh, it's, it's just all part of your training. And if, if you don't get this, it's hard to be just be thrown on the med stage. Yes, I did. Yes, I did, but remember, I had this peculiar background and family that made me feel that I was welcome wherever I went because I was the little princess. And I don't mean that in an ugly way. I mean that I didn't go in looking for, 
for uh, unhappiness or looking to be badly treated. I'm sure there were those who made comments that were not as nice, all that I wanted to hear, but I didn't hear it. And I always figure if there's a problem and I don't have it, you must have it. So it's your problem. I'm just going to sing. Perhaps that was a saving grace because I always went in as a guest. And as a guest, I sang a certain number of roles or a certain number of performances of a role, rested and then went to the next place or had time to, to study. Uh, I, I was never accepted into a house as a, a house singer. And that could have been good and that could have been bad. In that if you're a house singer, you have to sing everything that you're asked to sing or that you agree to sing but you might have to sing four nights a week, whereas I, as a guest singer, I didn't, I didn't have to do that. But either way, it, it depends on the personality and your, your ability, your stamina. You, uh, it depends on many things. What type of role you're singing? I don't think I want to sing four Aidas a week, but maybe four first ladies wouldn't be as bad. But all of that has to be, has to be taken into consideration and, and has to be well thought out. You just don't throw yourself in and let people do what they will with you. When the call, the call came in, I thought it was my friends who were always calling saying, oh, you're going to sing at the Met, or come and sing at the Met. And I said, well, I can't come because I have to go to the movies. And, um, and then he said, it was Mr. Bing the very first time. Robert Herman called the second time. And I realized that it was not a friend joking, and I nearly fell on the floor. I was in my brother's apartment at the time. And of course I wanted to do it. And of course I didn't care if it was that night or two nights later. It didn't matter at all. And I didn't feel badly for Miss Nielsen at all. I, thought, <laughs> I was happy. <laughs> Not that she was sick, that I, that I was going to do it. Two days. The next day, there was no rehearsal as such. The next day I went in. And the, the, next, the second day was the performance. I had just enough time to warn the whole family and friends group. And they didn't get in. <laughs> this was the old Met. I mean, at that time, we didn't think old Met. This was the Met. But uh, I didn't get nervous until the triumphal scene when I was standing there. And something I would tell my students, never do, never leave your character. But I left my character and realized I'm standing on the Met stage with a crown in my hand. And I promise you, my hands were shaking. That crown was moving. I thought it was going to fall on the floor. I was so, not nervous, excited. Excited. And my mother was there. By that time, my father had passed on. So my mother was like, I mean, she was singing that night, wasn't she? different, but you know, all wonderful, but not necessarily wonderful because somebody wearing the Hope Diamond might be in the audience. It's wonderful because you hopefully you've had a, you're working with people that you enjoy, and most of the time, all the time, I, I was always working with great friends and, and colleagues. Um, it was an, you, another production, usually it wasn't just always the same uh, repertoire. Um, there is excitement in the house when it's opening night, let's not kid ourselves. But there have been opening nights in other theaters. There have been, I mean, the first, the first performance with Thomas Shippers at the Philharmonic was for me just thrilling. I was singing, um, debuting in a piece that, uh, that had been commissioned by the Philharmonic from um, Samuel Barber, the Andromache. So I'll never forget that. I was being, playing another character and everybody was listening to this beautiful, beautiful music. And there, the, the night that we sang, that we did the Huguenots in London with Joan Sutherland, I, the people were just wonderful and responded. So, they, you know, we were carried out. We were literally carried out. And what was wonderful, and I keep saying this, it was not that they did that, it was that my mother was there to see it. Surprisingly, very often the same people, though. We still, Cheryl Mills and uh, Rogero Raimondi, we're still all friends, most of us not singing anymore. But um, the colleagues have been, I've been extraordinarily uh, happy and fortunate with people. I, I've never sung, I don't remember ever singing with anyone that was, un, that was not pleasant and who didn't want to work. You know, that's one thing about being in this profession. We want to work. We want to be here. 
You know, I don't care if you're short or, or, or tall. I'm so glad to be singing the part. I'll reach up or down. I don't care. And I think that we all felt that way. If anyone had a problem, it was their problem. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to sound as though I'm not concerned, but you, you have too much to do to take on pettiness. They were for me because I knew that I could count on them every time. I, when, if, if Shirley Verrett, if Grace Bunbury, if Fiorenza Casotto, if those ladies were singing Amneris and I, or Mignon Dunn, and I looked at her, I know she was glaring right back at me in character. I knew that I could count on them to be doing their part and their characters, their, their, the best singing they could do. Uh, and because of that, we always looked better because we held each other up. And uh, you want to be part of the best cast. You don't want to be either the best of a bad cast or the worst of a good cast. I think that the young people today need more coaching, more work on the languages, which is why the prelude to performance, not because I thought I was wonderful, but because I thought that I wasn't wonderful and that more could be done so that you could be better and be better prepared. Um, you, it's not just the voice. It has, it's the voice knowing how to sing a part, how to make the character work. And I think that it's unfair to throw a person on stage uh, and think that they're going to always come up to that level. You don't. If you're not trained in the direction to go up to that level, and if you're not given the chance to grow up there and some opportunities to sing uh, the parts uh, so that you can, little by little, arrive at the, the top level, you know, sometimes people think, oh, Tibaldi sprung into existence in 1951. That's not true. She had been singing in Italy for a while. Uh, the, many of those two people had sung for some years in, in, other, in their countries. But here, you don't have this, uh, the training ground yet. It's better. I'm not trying to say it's not better because there are companies all over. <laughs> Mr. DiChiara knows about this. He's fought hard for young people to be properly trained and all kinds of people. He's one of the few people that I can think of that, that's really gone out to, to, to include. And, uh, but it's hard work. It's expensive work. And it has to be continuous. Once you experience what it's really like to say something, you know, and I have to say, people like Latvi Mansuri, Tito Capobianco, and uh, Franco Enrico as these directors that made me know that the word was extremely important, that color was extremely important, even when I couldn't do it myself always. The moment it started happening, you're living on another level. You're no longer a singer. You go up to artistry that you don't go any place. You just keep developing. You keep working. And one of the issues is you've got to keep working. You can't stop and say, uh, I'm, there, I'm here. I've arrived. And with each part, I, I sang Santa late, late in my career, but I can't tell you how I fought for the character and sometimes even sacrificed what at one time would never have happened that I sacrificed a tone for, for a word. But there came the point in my life where the word really became that important to me because either you have the voice or you don't. And if you don't, don't do that part. Do something else that you can do. Not everybody has to sing Turandot, but I finally did. <laughs> I'm only saying that to say that you just can't sing any part. You have to be that character, and you have to say what that character needs to say and know what, she, what it is she needs to say and how it's said, how it's, it was said in that time of her life. When was that time? What was going on at that time? What, were the, what are the other people saying? What are the other people, what are their stories? Because they tell the story of Aida doesn't mean that everybody in that chorus doesn't have a story. And I got that from Latvi Mansuri, 1959, when I heard him say that to the Carmen chorus. Everybody has a story. And you perform on stage that way. I hope so. I hope so. But you know, when you're doing it, you can't step back and evaluate. Uh, somebody has to either make the comment that it's getting better or not, or stay the same, or it's getting worse. Um, I'm not talking about if the note cracks. I'm talking about if the character. Um, it's why we, we all need people looking at us. We need people to, in fact, to do just that for us. But we need a people that'll be honest. 
because so often you say, if somebody had told Miss So and So early enough that she wasn't singing as well as she used to, maybe she could have corrected that and, and sung for us even longer. Unless, of course, that's what she wanted to do. If that's what she wants to do or he wants to do, fine. But if I've heard singers that I adored be taken right to the rock's end of the voice and la when people were laughing, well, that's not fair. That's not right. Especially if that's all that person has to do with their lives, which is another story altogether. I've always had something else to do with life. You know, it, it didn't, my, life hap my life's happiness didn't depend on the next performance. I didn't feel that I, I was breaking down doors. I was made to feel always you had to sing as well as you could. But that, I would have felt that had I been green, because that's the way I was taught. I, as I said, and I'm not underestimating that there are those who have had experiences much less happy than mine, who really did see ugliness, because they came, they had to pass through ugliness. I didn't pass through ugliness. I passed through a great deal of encouragement and, um, and people that were saying, go, go, go. Uh, but of course, of course, I'm, I'm not stupid. I know that, that what exists out there. But again, I, th I think that if they don't want to hear me sing because of my color, then get somebody else. I'll go sing someplace else. That is your problem. You're the one missing my voice. I'm sorry. I can't take it on me that you, because you don't like me. On the other hand, if you do like me, I'll give you my best. My favorite character is usually the one I'm working on. I loved Lady Macbeth. Oh, did I love her. It was a challenge for me. It was, I thought it was a role people thought I would never be able to do. So that made me want to do it even more. And I had a great colleague in Cheryl. And, and I, you know, uh, for, that, for the, those times at the Met, there were other performances too. I loved Amelia and Baldwin Mascara, again, because she was such a wonderful woman. I, I loved Butterfly. There's no Cavalleria. I, there's no part that I didn't like. I was perhaps least warm about the um, Mozart roles. Loved them a different way, sang them hopefully with the same heart, but stylistically, you know, I, I couldn't do what I could do with some of those other characters. Um, enjoyed tremendously Elsa, a part that people have forgotten that I sang because it was a new, it was new and a, another style for me and it was just wonderful working in that element and I felt the same thing with, with the center. Um, but you see, I also like singing song literature still. I love songs because I think it's an opera in a little, in a little picture but you gotta paint them just as clearly as you do your character or more clear as a matter of fact. Um, I can't think of a character I'll tell you that once I was supposed to do Norma and had even rehearsed them and learned it uh, and had been promised one situation with, in terms of a director and conductor and when that changed I didn't want to do it because the director that I had been promised was going to give me rehearsals and the conductor I know would have given me rehearsals and I didn't feel that I should do Norma until I could be a Norma and I on my own by myself could not be a great Norma. I could sing it decently enough, but I was worried and cared about the character, and if I wasn't going to get that, then I didn't want to do it. I like the conductors that like to work, that like to say, look at this, watch this, let's, let's try this, and, and they're involved because they're learning, they're always learning. I like that Nello Santi used to sit down and sing the other roles, and you sang the roles you wanted to sing. He and Placido and I would go through Chenier after doing a, re a day of Vespi Siciliani all day long. We'd go downstairs and sing through something else. Those are the conductors that I like. Well, you know, you can hear all of these words all of your life. I'm honored, I'm thrilled. Uh, and you hear them and you believe them, but when you're feeling it, I tried to find other words. To I've just been walking around for the past weeks with a smile on my face, and people don't know why, because I've, I'm just so I'm happy to have been included. 
we have, they have coaching, they have combat, they have languages, languages. Uh, they have, um, we have um, a stage, direct stage direction, four hours a day, um, stage craft, uh, reading, the, reading the libretto uh, as, as, as prose, you know, as theater, and which is very different, you know, because they're not reading it to a time, a beat. And um, they work, the young people work from 10 until 6 every day. It's not easy. But it's uh, being involved with, its, with the language, the words, and the meaning of the words, and expressing those words properly. They have to know what's being said to them. They have to know what's being said about them. They have to know, uh, they have to know why, the whys of, of, oh, it's much more complicated than just getting up. And they have to stay in character. They have to keep their expression. They have to think through their person all the time. That's not easy when you're all along you've been told just sound beautiful. What happens between day one and days uh, and week six last performance is always a miracle. It's always a miracle. It's never, there's never been a time when we either thought, mm, this is going to be good, or this is going to be terrible, or this is, going, this is where it should be at this point of the, of the sessions. There's always something that happens because these young people, as I think we all should do, when the time comes, it ha make it happen. But it doesn't mean that it's always what we want, 100%. We, we sometimes say, we'd better work that better because that, that, should have, that should have been better. But we're always, we're always amazed at these young artists. They, they never let you down. Not all of them have the greatest voices in the world, but that's not what we're about. They have the right to learn. And some of them will not. We had one young lady who, after the first session, said to me, you know, Mr. Roy, I just don't have my, my voice isn't as good as some of these others, and I'm not going to have a career. And I said, why do you think that? And she said, well, I could just hear when I say I'm in working with them. She is now working in music in a very wonderful position, very, very happy. We're still friends, and that's already been six years, five years. Uh, but she realized that she wasn't going to have a great singing career. But she wanted to stay in music, and she did that. Sometimes we might be working with the next great stage director. You never know.